Right, so as I said, I'm Chris Brady from the University of Warwick, where I'm a um, senior research software engineer there. And this is some work that was funded under the uh, embedded CSE program of the UK's National Com Supercomputing Service, just have to acknowledge them. And this here is the link for if you want to actually get this software, it's released under a permissive um, license. So uh, do please have a look at it if you think that there's anything interesting in it. Okay, so first of all, what sort of motivation for the idea of input file parsers? So users nowadays of codes um, want a friendly and easy to learn experience when using software, scientific software as much as any other, um, but you equally want them to be able to store and reproduce initial conditions. Reproducible research, very, very important. And it's also quite important for an awful lot of people, particularly from the area that I came from originally of plasma physics, uh, which I should say also is pretty heavy Fortran area, although it's starting to move a bit. Um, but it's been HPC pretty much from day one uh, of using computers. Um, so it has to work well on high performance computing kits. So for that sort of thing, structured input files work really quite well. So the direct motivation for this project was work on a code called Epoch, which is um, what's called a particle in cell code. <coughs> um, Epoch is a massively parallel code using MPI parallelism, regularly used on tens of thousands of cores, hundreds of thousands isn't unusual, and I believe people have taken it to millions now. Uh, the code's been in use since 2008 and is still very popular. It's the most popular plasma physics code on Archer, the people that funded us. Um, and one of the secrets to it being so successful is it's very easy to run. And the fact that it's still so popular is one of the reasons why, why people are willing to pay us to keep it up to date. So here's a section of one of the input files that um, Epoch uses. This one sets up a laser on a boundary because it uses electromagnetic waves, as you might imagine, for a plasma code. So I'm not going to talk through this in detail, but it does have some elements that I need to describe. So the whole thing is termed a block. Um, these things on the left are called keys, on the right are called values. This thing here, Gauss, is a function, because the whole point of this is it's a mathematical parser, even though uh, it doesn't use any external libraries. It's all written in pure Fortran. Uh, you have named constants like femto there. You have variables like time. The difference between a constant and a variable is that a constant always has the same value. A variable can have a different value every time it's evaluated. One there is, of course, a literal. So a little bit more background. The original version of Epoch in 2008 already had an input deck and maths parser system. Given what the state of the real world Fortran compiler infrastructure back in 2008 was like, it was written in Fortran 95. Um, so basically the way you identified what block you were in, so what you wanted the code to do in response to that block, was a large list of conditional statements. And then inside each one of those uh, pieces of code dealing with that, there were more conditionals to find the keys. Um, it's always been a tokenizing parser, so to find those tokens, it had a large list of conditional statements to find the tokens. And then when it needed to evaluate those tokens, all these terms I'll make a bit clearer a bit later. Um, but when it evaluates the tokens, there are more conditional statements. So as you might imagine, lots of branches, not tremendously efficient. And equally, the performance basically scales as the number of um, elements that you can have, the number of mathematical expressions that the parser understands. So. Uh, last year, we were, as part of this package under the Archer ECSE program, um, engaged to write uh, what's called the Epoch Input System version 2, or ICE 2. This has been updated and uses Fortran 2003 onwards. It optionally has some Fortran 2008 features, but as was mentioned uh, in the keynote this morning, compiler support for Fortran 2008 still not quite good enough that I wanted to make use of it everywhere. Um, particularly because one of the things that we found out from maintaining a Fortran code is a number of people with uh, uh, G-Fortran version 4.4 or so still around is actually surprisingly high. Um, however, when we wrote ICE2, we decided <clears throat> that there was no point tying it into Epoch the way its existing code was, <clears throat> but to try and write a general purpose library that we can use in a wide variety of codes. Um, 
Under the bonnet, there's a lot of changes and improvements. If you've ever seen the Epoch code base, you'd see a lot of them immediately. But the main things are that the lookup of the block and the keys and the mathematical expression token generation has been switched from conditionals to hash tables, so theoretically order one. And the evaluation has switched to procedure pointers, uh, which is obviously order one. So we've been able to make a lot of improvements by going to modern Fortran. Uh, the new thing is object oriented, so we have all the advantages of encapsulation. The data structure stuff, like the hash tables, are done using unlimited polymorphic pointers. That does come with the performance hit, so they're not used in the absolutely performance critical bits of ICE, but they make things very easy. And the procedure pointers, meaning that you can link arbitrary data to an action, are very helpful as well. Now, the downsides to Fortran, because uh, obviously, as research software engineers, we work in more than one language is really it would be nice to have compile time polymorphism. I know that's a bit of a sore subject in the area, but it would be really useful. Uh, and as I said, old compilers are still very common in the wild. So now on to what the library actually is and does. So the first bit I'm going to talk about is a maths parser. Now I know that you know we've got people here who write actual compilers, and if you come from that background, this stuff's trivial, but an awful lot of physicists, when I talk about this, ask how the hell can you actually pass maths? How, how do you do it? They know it must be possible, but it's not something that's a, a normal sort of scientific program or ever see. So very quick introduction. You first of all have uh, this set of symbols, all colored differently. You have sine, which is a function, two, which is a literal, star, which is an operator, and pi, which is a constant. So the first thing that we encounter reading from left to right is sine. Sine is a function. We don't know what to do with functions, so I put it on a stack called the intermediate stack. Two is a number. I know exactly what to do with it. It goes on the output stack. An operator goes on the intermediate stack because I don't know what to do with it. And pi, even though it's a named constant, I know exactly how to interpret pi. That goes on the output. And now at the end of that, I can just start popping stuff off the intermediate stack onto the output stack. So the final result is 2 pi times sine, which if I bracket, you can sort of see is basically the same thing, but I've now basically converted from normal infix maths to postfix or reverse Polish notation. This, however, has a huge advantage from um, a computational perspective of you can just start at the bottom of that stack that I have worked my way up and evaluate it very easily. Um, I should give credit where credit's due, even if it's a long time ago. I obviously didn't invent this. This is a, an algorithm by Edgar Dijkstra called the shunting yard algorithm. Okay, so here we go. We have my input stack there. I have two. I evaluate that and I put it on the results stack as just the number two. Pi, I now have to turn it into an actual number, so it becomes 3.14. Asterisk now is an operator, so it has to consume two values from that result stack and push the result of that onto the stack, and you get 6.28. Sine does the same consumption of one thing now and push, and I get zero, and just by popping the answer off that result stack, I can get the result of my evaluation. So, what do you actually have to do in Fortran if you want to use this parser to do that? Well, not very hard. This is one of the demos that comes with ICE. Um, and you have to use the module. You have to create the parser. Um, you have to tokenize an input string, check there are no errors. If there are no errors, you evaluate it, and then you print the result. You'll notice that result is an allocatable array of real with a kind specified by the library. Uh, and it can return more than one result if you want. Uh, there is actually some syntactic sugar, meaning that you can go straight from a string to a result if you want, but not showing that here. So from a perspective of using this in a code, this has some very nice things. As you can sort of see from that, it has error handling. If I put in um, something that's wrong, like giving sign two parameters, it tells me um, what the error was, it tells me where it was, and a few other useful things, and that's all handled automatically inside the library. I'll show what these slightly cryptic numbers mean a bit later. So at the moment, what you have is basically a calculator. What if you want to add other things? Well, here, for example, is how I would add a function. I call the parser's add function method. I give it a name, Cauchy. I call what we call an action function. I say the error code, and I say how many parameters I expected to have. A Cauchy distribution takes three parameters, and here is the action function in a module. Um, 
all the action functions for any functions for any of those variables that can return a different value every time they're called look the same. You'll notice they're bind C functions. These are bind C because it means that these functions can come from Fortran, they can come from C, they can come from any language you want. Um, it also means that you can use something like DL open and DL sim to have runtime plugins if you want. Um, but there it is, that's just implementing a Cauchy distribution. And I could then use that um, in an expression and it would evaluate exactly as you'd expect. <coughs> so, um, what um, can you put in? Well, operators, you actually can't, a user of the code can't add operators at the minute. There are built in operators, but you can't add new ones. There are unary operators, there are binary operators, there are no ternary operators. Constants map a name to a constant value, they're easy. Um, there are functions which take parameters and return a variable. You saw there that I gave it uh, a list of a, a number of parameters it should expect and it would return an error if there weren't that many. But you can have variadic functions if you want that check their parameter count and return an error if it's an error or work um, with as many parameters as they've been given. There are functors in there, which are things that are like functions, but have instances and store state. Uh, Fortran itself doesn't have functors, but it's implemented using uh, derived types um, <coughs> in uh, uh, behind the scenes, just not one where you're overloading the round bracket operator. Uh, you can have variables, which are a name mapped to a result function, which is like the result function I showed you for the Cauchy function, but there are never any parameters to a variable. And there are also things called stack variables that mean that a user can define a mathematical expression and then give it a name and you can um, use the name later. Okay, so one of the things that's uh, very important in getting acceptable performance out of this is that there's a simplifier built in based on abstract syntax tree type thing. Here's a very simple thing, sine two pi x times cos four pi y. Here on the left is the syntax tree that you get simply and naively out of the um, parser. Not much can be done because X and Y here are defined as um, variables. They have a different value every time you call it. That's how Epoch uses this parser. Um, I'm not gonna go in it, but there's actually a way of passing in parameters from the outside code so that they're available inside those action functions and you can write ones that use that data, uh, but it can simplify two pi and four pi into just constants. That is obviously a fairly trivial example and wouldn't speed anything up by very much, but here's an example from one of the uh, demos that come with Epoch of an expression setting up a plasma distribution function, and that's what it looks like without simplification, and that's what it looks like with simplification. So that one's about 10 times quicker after the simplifiers had a go at it. Um, I'm not really going to talk much about performance here, but um, ICE does perform extremely well. It is a lot faster than um, embedding something like a Python interpreter in your code. Um, generally speaking, you find that uh, for every thing that actually has to be evaluated, every operation, every function, uh, you're looking at probably around 20 to 30 CPU cycles over and above whatever the function actually does. Um, which is really quite fast. Uh, the latest feature, which isn't in the release branch yet, I'm still putting the finishing touches to it, is the fact that you can get analytical derivatives of expressions. So um, this here shows how you set something up. I add a variable, which is x squared times y behind the scenes. And I say for that symbol, I set the derivative. Um, if I'm doing x to y and der taking the derivative with respect to x, uh, then it's 2xy. If I take the derivative with respect to y, it's x squared. Um, and this here is showing it with a function where I just have a function that takes two parameters. Here I haven't bothered to say that it expects two parameters, but I could. a times b. Now I can't say derivative with respect to x or respect to y because it's with respect to the um, parameters of that function. So I say that it's param1 times d param2 uh, plus param2 times d param1, which is it's the parameter in position one times the derivative of the parameter in position two plus blah, blah, blah. Fairly obvious. Um, and then to actually use it to get the derivative, I create a stack, which here is called, oh dear, here is called f stack. 
um, and I say I want d stack dx, which is another stack to hold the result, and I want to take the derivative with respect to x, I can then evaluate d stack dx like it was any other stack and get the result, and it will give me the analytical derivative of the function that I gave it. So that's it for the um, maths pass a bit. The deck parser um, is the other part. That's a bit that actually deals with that structured text file. So again, just quickly going through this, you have a block, which is a collection of connected keys, a type, which is a definition of a block. Um, not really gonna go into it, but if one, someone wants to look back through these slides afterwards, this is um, kind of helpful. You have an instance, which is an actual block in a deck as opposed to the definition of a block. Uh, you have a key, you have a val which is you know a named item which is associated with a value. You have a value which is an input that the host code wants somehow, and you have a definition which I'll come to in a bit. And root is a term that I'll use in a couple of places, which is the base block that holds all other blocks. So here is that epoch block again, just so you can sort of see it in context. Um, a deliberate design decision of the deck parser uh, was to separate the definition of the structure of an input deck from the instantiation of a deck. So Epoch was written in about 2008. Um, JSON wasn't really a thing then, Toml wasn't a thing, YAML was, um, but it wasn't as big as it is now. So at the time, there seemed no reason to try and use a standard off the shelf uh, text file format. We didn't. We created our own, this epoch style format. And at the moment, that's all that's shipped with ICE 2. But because of the way that we've separated the definition of a deck, i.e. what blocks are in it, what keys are in each block, I should say, um, I usually have a slide in this talk, but I don't have it here. Um, but um, I usually say that uh, there are, you can have blocks within blocks, which you can. That's perfectly fine. So you say what blocks are within what blocks, what keys are within what blocks, and that's the definition. And also what should happen when you encounter those. Um, but you can write a parser that would take JSON, YAML, XML, Windows, INI files, or TOML, and that would be a drop-in replacement. For a user of ICE to load that other type of file, he would just create a different type of object. And that would be it. All the rest of his code would work unchanged. Um, the other thing that's quite nice here is that you can call the parts of a definition programmatically. So effectively, you're using your input file to map from some sort of structured hierarchical um, format to internal state in your code. The idea primarily is that this is used for reading text files, but there's actually no reason at all why you couldn't use that to call from um, some uh, scripting language. And that uh, can be done with a bit of additional work and support for that is in there. Um, the definition basically specifies action functions which will happen when certain events occur. Unlike the maths parser, which is both highly time critical uh, and can be made fairly elegant in both languages, uh, here we have separate C and Fortran versions of all the actions to keep a relatively um, nice interface for both C and Fortran programmers. So here's what this looks like. I create a text deck parser. That's a thing that reads um, input epoch type decks that may wind up renamed. Um, you have a deck definition and a deck block definition. And I initialize my definition to get that root block. I add a block called block one to the root block. I add keys to all of them. And these key stress sub and key val sub are action functions that um, are bound when the key is encountered. And I'll show what they do. Uh, and this then reads the uh, deck file called demo.deck, checks for errors, and, um, and takes the definition as a parameter, and um, does whatever, and as that goes through, whatever you say in those action functions will happen. So here is the key str sub. So I check for other double quotes in the string. So this hands me the key and the value as strings. If there isn't a double quote, I return the status, status not handled, which means this action function didn't handle the key. Otherwise I print, I found the text value. Uh, there is actually something there. I, I've 
trimmed out a bit of the thing, that UQ is the position of the outer, the upper quote. I trim that code out to make it clearer on the slide. Um, this is the one for the numerical one, where now you get the key text as a string and the values as an array of uh, numbers again, real numbers given here, returned from one of those parsers. Um, and so if you run this over a deck, um, this is what you get. You have a beginner block, a key with double quotes, you end the block. Here you have a key with a number and a key with an expression, and they do about what you'd expect. So uh, last uh, sort of bit, we're reaching the finale now. Here's that again. What about um, if I'd made a misspelling? If I'd not put Gauss with two S's, if I'd put Gauss with one S, well, this is actually what Epoch, the version that's uh, now we're sort of in development with this library in, you instel, instead get uh, this, it says unknown value or function at, and it tells me, I, I said I wanted to look in the directory test for the file, test input deck line five, it says line five there again, and this is the character position in that line. If you went back and looked at that, that would match up exactly, and it tells you exactly where the problem is. Um, right, one last feature before I reach a conclusions. All of the stuff, the, um, the constants, the functions, everything in the maths parser, all of the keys, all of the blocks, everything in um, the uh, deck parser can have a description associated with it, which is a textual description of what that key does, if it's a deck key or what that function does, if it's a maths parser function, and the parser or the deck definition can return you a uh, markdown version of that information on request. So effectively, if you want to, you can program a code that carries a chunk of its own documentation with it. And this is the one that comes straight out of Epoch. You just start the code, type deck info, and it'll spit out markdown that I've rendered here to a PDF. So conclusions. Um, ICE2 provides a complete open source library for reading input files containing rich mathematical notation. Uh, the Fortran version is pretty much fully featured. There is going to be a full C interoperability uh, layer, um, which uses integer handles to represent instances of Fortran objects. Obviously, even Fortran uh, 2018 doesn't uh, allow you to use Fortran objects in C. Um, it is a statically linked library that doesn't have any actual internal comms, but is written to be as re-entrant re as far as possible. So it's well suited for high performance computing environments because you can link it in easily with your code. Um, you can um, you know, very easily use it in a multi-threaded or um, HPC environment. It does have a few helpful things like being able to pack up text files into a portable format that can be shunted off uh, through you know an MPI bcast um, rather than every node having to read the input file separately um, but they don't actually include their own MPI that's literally just here's a string send it um, and uh, you can also um, provide a link uh, from your code to other software drivers if you want by using that deck definition to uh, um, call um, the, de the, the mapping that you've made effectively from uh, the internals of your code to a logical external structure. And that is it. I don't have an end slide, but I have finished. Thank you very much for this very instructive talk. Um, we have some questions. So the first is, would ICE2 be applicable and useful also to desktop workstations? Um, it would certainly be applicable. Um, I mean, useful, I think, uh, yes, definitely. If you want to write a, a piece of software that, you know, it has no MPI and it'll compile fine with just a simple Fortran compiler. Um, so yes, you can use it. The advantage of a, um, the advantage of a text mode parser is less on a work in a workstation environment, but it's still there. So, um, yeah, if you find that useful, then it will definitely work. Um, next question. Um, I want to make sure that I understand. 
at the, at, at the current, I still cannot set up its own function or I as a programmer can create functions that the user can call in the input. Okay, I think I understand that. Um, so no, you have to specify what function is called. So you, you specify a function that's called when a certain um, condition is encountered. Um, I'm actually not 100% sure I do understand that now I start answering it. Um, right, yeah, so, so this is for adding, um, um, uh, input to a Fortran code. It's, it's not a, um, anything in its own. So the point is you, it has some language, some, some mathematical expressions that it understands built in, uh, and you can add more on its own. It, um, it's really a fairly dumb calculator, I think. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Anyways. Um, what about a report generator based on the same principles? Um, so you mean a report on sort of what a user is specified and things like that? Um, if so, I mean, if that's sort of the idea, then yes, it's, it's in there. There are callbacks, uh, you know, there are sort of generic callbacks for when things have happened and it'll tell you what somebody's done, what somebody's specified and the like. Um, Um, uh, so yes, yes, uh, that could be done. I'd have to sort of look into exactly what that guy was, was thinking about. Maybe if he wants to talk to me after this, um, can clear that up. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, another question, um, but are there any numbers on the performance of the mass evaluation? How much slower would it be compared to na native functions? Okay, I, I touched on that briefly about, yeah, uh, some, uh, someone did ask, about 30 clock cycles per evaluation. So the answer is it's basically intermediate between native code and something like Python. Um, you'll, you're not going to reach native code performance, really. Um, there is actually basically, I, I didn't talk about it, but there is a way each of those stacks can actually have a function that just returns the whole answer bound to it. They're different to the, the other functions that I showed. And that is if you uh, desperately want more performance, but want to still use this library, you can create a function that gives an answer and say, here it is. Good. Uh, last question, maybe. Um, can I still detect touching of all keywords? I mean, detecting all the written keywords in the group that are in the code. Right. Um, no, actually, it, it can't. That would genuinely be something that would be very useful. Uh, I will, as soon as we're finished here, I will put that, uh, I will put that on the to-do list because that, that actually is, in retrospect, something that probably should have been there from the beginning. Epoch has its own way of handling it, which is a bit separate, uh, which is why I didn't think about it. But yes, some, some at least base level ability to, to detect that should definitely be in there. Good. Uh, thank you very much again for the very nice talk.